My sister and I spent the last five years helping our mother to the end of her life. And while mom was busy forgetting all of what she knew, we learned about heartbreak, perseverance, devotion, devastation, and the hilarity that comes when you're forced to accept the unacceptable. That's the voice of Kitty Norton, a Portland woman who directed the new documentary Wine, Women, and Dementia on PBS. Kitty joins me on the couch along with Allison Schreier of Issaquah, who is also in the film. And since you both put it in the title, I felt it was fitting to have a glass of wine <laughs> with this discussion. So cheers to both of you all and cheers to this film, ladies. Thank you. Yes. And while you guys are having a sip, Kitty, you moved back to your hometown to care for your mom after mm. she was diagnosed. Mm, good. Ooh, I'm glad. <laughs> What inspired you to document her journey? Uh, well, I've been in the storytelling industry for years, working in regional theater, and then I was an assistant editor for uh, several NBC shows down in LA when uh, I had to move back home. And I've always been a storyteller myself, so I knew I wanted to, if nothing else, just remember this mm -hmm. story for both me and mom, like how we got through it, how we did this, and what it was like. And then I started writing a blog and I started using those videos to show other caregivers like mom was just absolutely hilarious today or yeah. You know, all I I couldn't even get out of bed today. I was so sad or you know, I just wanted to share and have that community. Right. I wanted to tell the story. Definitely. And you were recording a video for your parents' 50th anniversary when you noticed that your mom couldn't come up with your dad's name. Mm -hmm. How quickly did her condition deteriorate? Not quickly at all. Really? Uh, you know, this is a, can be a very long disease. Some people it's shorter, but I think for the most part, it can go anywhere from two to 20 to 30 years. People can live with dementia. So my mom was, she would go in spurts with the progression. It's mm -hmm. so like when my father died, that rushed her pretty far yeah, ahead. Um, when she, before she accepted the diagnosis, and those two years at the beginning where she was trying to hide it all the time, that made her progression go faster. As soon as she kind of accepted it and didn't care anymore, things slowed way down. Wow. So we had fits and starts. It mm -hmm. was never steady for us. It was, boom, oh boy, what just happened? Or, wow, we've really been in this stage for a long time and it's kind of nice. Yes, and Allison, of course, I want to bring you into the conversation. Your husband was diagnosed when he was only 47 years old. Is that right. correct? That is correct. Can you tell me about that diagnosis? Yeah, so he was diagnosed with something called frontotemporal dementia. So unlike Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common dementia, which we think of things like memory loss and the inability to find one's way places, frontotemporal dementia is in the name. It's the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes of the brain. And so frontal lobe executive functioning, so the inability to see things from another per person's perspective, to filter, the inability to set up a sequence of events and follow through. So he had something called behavioral variant. And so what uh, the, the greatest manifestation in his case was that he just started becoming like a different person with very significant personality changes. He started behaving a lot like a teenager. Wow. An irresponsible teenager. An <laughs> irresponsible yes. teenager. And I wanted to mention because you have two children as well. So if you can speak on how it was obviously raising two children and like you said, you know, a husband that was, you know. Yeah, sure. So that's where the wine comes from. Okay. Right? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, my, some wine. <laughs> my kids were 12 and 15 when my husband was diagnosed. And so um, the, the impact, the, his way of being in the world was... Um, very uh, unusual. He would say and do things that were outrageous and that were really difficult for kids to be around. And so I think that the greatest tragedy for us was that we had to have him move out of the house much oh. sooner than he would have had it just been me living with him because it just wasn't cool to have kids living with somebody who was behaving the way that he was behaving. That's so difficult. It was wow. Hard. Yeah. And how did you two connect? Uh, through my blog. Okay. So I. My sister and I took over my mom's care in 2016. I was writing by 2018, and I wrote about the personal part. I, did, I didn't write about research, I didn't write about new drugs. I wrote about day-to-day -day stuff. And a lot of it was funny, some of it was horrific. 
Um, and I started to attract these caregivers who were like, wow, I'm feeling the same way. Nobody's talking about this. You know, we're not stuck in the tragedy narrative. We are also, also are living our lives and helping our person live their life. And nobody's kind of voicing that. So the people I ended up going to meet for the documentary were all, we had never met in person. They were all people who came to me through the blog and then we became online friends after that. That's so amazing to have these relationships. And a lot of the documentary is really showing real talk. So mm -hmm. why show, I mean, you've touched on this, but why was that so important to really show like the real raw experience? Uh, because this is how caregivers talk. If you want to understand the, the dementia journey, you need to understand both sides of the equation. Mm -hmm. And the family caregiver is half of the story. And we need community, and we don't often find it. We get very, very isolated. And I knew after mom died, I wanted to go meet these five people. And I wanted to sit and have a glass of wine with them. And I just wanted to talk caregiver smack until we were out of our stories. <laughs> And then I decided to bring a film crew and a sound guy with us. That was the original plan, is just to go meet you guys. And, and now and here we are yeah, on here we PBS. Are. So I want to know, how can people see this film? Yeah, so we have PBS distribution for the next three years. Amazing. Um, it, we premiere on November 2nd on PBS Online and also on the PBS app. And we're in several markets, but we're not in Washington yet. So the, it would also be airing on PBS um, throughout those three years. But, uh, and that's a one, year, one hour version. Mm -hmm. And then we have the full feature that will be available mid-November if you go to winewomenanddementia.com. Amazing, this is such an important topic um, and of course we want to make sure we have time to cheers you wanted to yes. cheers <laughs> to all the caregivers cheers to you all as well for making this film and i hope everyone sees it it's such an important discussion mm -hmm. and conversation and thank you for showing such a raw real story thank you thank you yes. cheers caregivers yeah. cheers cheers cheers, cheers. <laughs> And you can, of course, watch Wine, Women, and Dementia starting November 2nd on PBS stations. It'll also be available to stream it all on the PBS app.